company title. This program is uh, dedicated to our friend Ann Thomas, who passed away about a year ago. And um, she was a mentor to me and a friend, and I miss her. Uh, but, and she was a good friend of the library, came to a lot of her programs. You know she would have been here today, probably sitting right in there. And um, uh, she helped us out a lot. She let us uh, record and share her stories on the library's website. And uh, I am going to give you now to her son, who made the trip to be here today, Scott Thomas. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome. And just want to share the experience of just being humbled by the attendance here today to uh, celebrate Black History Month in Wheeling and uh, Professor Trotter. And I uh, just want to speak on my mother's behalf real quick. Uh, this Saturday, the 22nd, will be the uh, one year anniversary that uh, she joined the heavens with Clyde and my brother. And uh, so missed, but so proud of the same breath. That uh, I had parents that were trailblazers in everything that they did. They set the example for me to follow. They choose to fill. Uh, gone out there in the world and tried to do my best, but you know, still not in the clock. Um, I have to give praise to Mr. Duffy, his staff, and the, the High County Public Library for the sole purpose of what they do, the research and their inclusiveness, uh, the inclusiveness to understand that history doesn't just involve one group of people, and that America is America because of everybody's efforts, no matter the color, you know, race, creed, gender, what have you. So, um, big hand of applause to Sean Duff. <laughs> Sean and his efforts and her ability to uh, share her specific experience uh, coming up in Wheeling free civil rights. And uh, she would talk on end about, you know, because uh, we all know my mom loved to talk. So Sean, <laughs> Sean was a great listener. And like he said, uh, you know, he looked up to her for mentorship, for friendship, and uh, just a great bond there that, that I cherish and I thank Sean all the time when I get the chance. So uh, a couple of things I'd like to share before we introduce uh, Professor Trotter is a couple of experiences that I continue to think about that my mom shared with me. And because I'm the generation after that, how I would have uh, addressed the issue. So my mom uh, went to uh, Lincoln School, which was uh, segregated all the way up until her last year in high school in 1956. Uh, the state of West Virginia, uh, desegregated high schools, and her senior year was at Wheeling High. So she was in that class of 1956 to graduate from Wheeling High as, a, as an integrated class. And she shared with me, you know, some of the uh, trials and tribulations of being a person, because she could have uh, chosen to stay at Lincoln, but she, you know, she stepped forward and took on that, that task of being the first and carrying the torch, uh, you know, for, for other black students that possibly uh, in lower grades that, you know, wanted to follow. And she, she shared some of those experiences. A couple experiences that, uh, that stick out in particular is uh, another fact that my mom, when she graduated from Wheeling High, was one of the, was the first black female to graduate from the High Valley Medical Nursing School. And she told me about when she was uh, going to school, all of the ladies in her class would go to this one particular place for lunch, and she wasn't welcome, and uh, because of the color of her skin, and the uh, students, you know, picked up on that, and uh, they got behind her and they boycotted this particular restaurant or cafe that they all went to. It was like this is the OV sat over to the left. I, I don't know what street, but uh, but they. They boycotted, and uh, the owner soon, you know, realized, okay, he had to make a choice. And those types of choices were made all throughout America based off of sit-ins and boycotts because of uh, the lack of inclusiveness. 
And um, so that, that really, you know, wow, how would I have dealt with that, you know? But it was, it was comforting to know that her fellow students got behind the cause. And so I fully realized as an African American that the achievements that have been made up to today wouldn't have been made if it wasn't for white people, Caucasian, whatever you want to say, uh, didn't get behind that effort and understand the humanity in all of us. So uh, that was one experience. Another one was um, I always thought, I was born in 1965, and I always wondered, you know, where were my parents when MLK was assassinated? You know, what was going through their minds? Uh, how did that impact them here in the local community? And uh, I don't know why I'm thinking about these things now. I never had that conversation with my mother to ask her, you know, that specific yeah. set of questions. So, uh, once again, I, I didn't have to come up through that. I was born in 65, so the people that came before me made the sacrifices for me to have to take fight that I lead. And uh, I'm, like I said, I'm just thankful to uh, have parents uh, such as Clyde and, and, and my mother and um, be able to share this experience with you. So, uh, moving along, today at Lunch with Books, uh, the Ann Thomas Memorial Lecture with Dr. Joseph William Trotter, Jr. Dr. Joseph William Trotter, Jr. is the John Eagle Professor of History, the Social Justice and Past History Department Chair. Recently inducted to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he is also the director and founder of Carnegie Mellon Center for African American and Urban Studies and the Economy, uh, and that all falls under the acronym COS, C A U S E. Uh, a pioneer in the development of U.S. urban, labor, and working class history, his scholarship includes a wide range of scholarly books, essays, and articles in professional journals and edited collections. His most recent work, Workers on Arrival, Black Labor, and the Making of America. And yes, I'm going to highlight it on here, we have copies for sale. <laughs> Cash or check. Okay, this particular book chronicles African-American urban life since the Atlantic slave trade. He has served on boards and committees of a variety of professional organizations, including the National Endowment for the Humanities. He is also past president of the Labor and Working Class History Association and current president-elect of the Urban History Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Joseph William Trotter. This is an exciting moment, and I want to thank uh, Scott for that introduction and for sharing uh, stories, you know, about his mother's experiences. Um, and one reason I'm so excited about today and being able to uh, share some thoughts with you from my book is that um, Sean uh, invited me to be the first speaker in this uh, Ann Thomas uh, Memorial Lecture Series. And that's an extraordinary honor. In part because I'm a West Virginian. <laughs> <laughs> I owe a great deal to this state. I grew up in McDowell County until I was 16 years old, and then my mother, who had become a widow by that time, uh, had to move the family out, and we moved to a small town in Ohio. Uh, but West Virginia is very deeply rooted in my system, and it accounts for the kind of work. Uh, that I do. Um, and so I just want to thank you, the Ohio State Library, Sean, all of you, and especially the audience. I mean, you came out at noon, and you know, it's quite an audience here, and so I appreciate uh, all of this. Uh, so let us, without further delay, let us turn uh, to this book. Oh, and wow, I can't forget. Thanks to my wife, LaRue, <laughs> for coming to this event with me. My wife. Uh, the love of my life, 47 years, and then we'll work it out. <laughs> now we can talk about the book. <laughs> um, this book is deeply rooted in my work as a professional historian. Um, when I arrived in Pittsburgh, I teach at Carnegie <coughs> University as 
Well, Scott made clear. Uh, I arrived at Carnegie Mellon 35 years ago. And when I came to Pittsburgh, uh, it was an extraordinarily um, fruitful and promising moment in my career. Because in 1985, the University of Illinois Press <coughs> had published my first book entitled Black Milwaukee, The Making of an Industrial Proletarian. And so, you know, young scholars at that time, they were trying to navigate the tenure stream, right? And so Black Milwaukee gave me tenure. So I could, oh man, I might be able to do this for a while. So it was an exciting moment. Uh, but another item that is closely related to my West Virginia experience is that I had always been interested in studying how African Americans became part of the mountain state. And how is it that my father became a coal miner, uh, and my mother and father migrated to West Virginia uh, from the uh, Birmingham area of Alabama, and he took a job uh, in the coal field. And while in the coal fields, my mother and father produced a family of 14 children. Uh, Ten girls and uh, four boys, and I'm the oldest son, okay? And so, you know, Another story I have to tell is that Scott didn't know this, but my name is not Joseph. <laughs> it's Joe, plain and simple. <laughs> but in any case, West Virginia uh, sort of stimulated me to write my second book, uh, which was published in 1990, and it's called Whole Class and Color, uh, African Americans in Southern West Virginia between 1915 and 1932. Uh, so, you know, coming to Pittsburgh, teaching at Carnegie Mellon, getting two books published, very exciting. But what was not so exciting is that the experiences of African American workers and white workers as well, uh, this was not an exciting time uh, for them. Uh, the steel industry and other manufacturing uh, plants collapsed, and there was unemployment and suffering all around. And so as a historian, excited as I was about my research, I had to think about how is it that my research plays some role in trying to help people think about ways to really address contemporary issues. History is not worth very much if it doesn't help us deal with our current uh, moment. And so I resolved that the sort of history that I conducted, uh, I, by the way, I was convinced uh, that poor and working class people would find a way out, that they had the capacity, the resolve to survive and to move beyond the deteriorating manufacturing economy. And so my generation of historians, uh, people that I worked with, people whose work intersected with mine, we were convinced <coughs> that poor and working class people would find a way out. And we were convinced that our research had to reinforce that process. And so one reason that I wrote Workers on Arrival is to really produce a story <coughs> that tries to address the long history of poor and working class black people in America. But Workers on Arrival was also stimulated by another dimension of life. Some of you know, many of you know, that last year was 2018. That was the 400th anniversary of the first African people to land in America. And as I look forward writing this book, you know, leading up to 2019, I said, you know, I'm double motivated because here is an African-American man writing this history of African-American people over a 400 year period when my relatives and ancestors were enslaved uh, just within the confines of Virginia, Alabama, and other places. So symbolically, it was important in my mind to produce this book at this time to celebrate the 400th 
anniversary of the uh, residents of black people in North America. Okay. But then there were some contemporary issues. There were some more problematic issues that drove the, um, the writing of this book. And I want to say a few words about the writing of the book before I turn to share with you some of what I found and some of what I argued. Um, in 2016, the presidential election uh, that brought the current president to office, um, Donald Trump, and the way in which that election signals certain kinds of changes in America that had uh, profound implications for American democracy, for race, for African American history. And some of you remember after that election in 2016 that newspapers, magazines, uh, television, the media exploded in conversation about the meaning of the working class in American politics. And a lot of this discussion, almost all of it, tended to focus on what was called the white working class. People were really interested in knowing if we talk about politics and conservatism in American life, is that politics driven fundamentally by working class poor and working class white people? And so the airwaves were filled with these discussions about how poor and working class white people uh, regarded American politics and regarded their future in America. But it struck me that so much of this conversation could go forward without acknowledging that African Americans are part of the working class. And so what I found is that too many people, white people, working class white people in particular too, they envisioned that black people were part of a race. They were not part of a class. And so when they thought about black people, they thought of black people as a people that is characterized and identified by their color and their blackness. They think of them as a people characterized by their status in the class structure for they are working class people. And so I, I, I was motivated to really push forward on this book because I wanted to underscore the importance of seeing African Americans as part of a larger American working class, but a part of the American working class that has its own distinctive history and its own engagement with colors of racial inequality. So that this wrestling with the intersections of being black as well as poor and working class was part of the motivation uh, to get this book, uh, this book out. And also it, it wanted to uh, challenge certain kinds of ways that working class white people had this perception, and I think continue to too often have this perception that even when they recognize that black people are workers, they perceive black people as having a poor work ethic. Uh, black people are perceived as being so much more consumers than they are producers for the, for the society and the economy. And that in some ways they are more liabilities to American democracy than they are uh, assets. Okay. And that they are in some ways takers. They take things, but they don't give. All of those stereotypes bothered me. And I believe that in writing this book, I would have to underscore something about the way black people contributed to the building of America, its cities, and the nation from the beginning. And so part of what I want to talk about today is what Workers on Arrival uh, offers in terms of understanding uh, the lives of African American uh, people. So let us start. Workers on Arrival treats African Americans as key and indispensable assets in the growth and development of the United States 
at one of the wealthiest nations on earth. From their arrival in North America during the colonial period through the 20th century, black workers, first as enslaved people and later as free people, helped to build and maintain American cities as well as plantations and farms. And so one part of this book is to correct a misperception about the Great Migration. Everybody tend to focus on the Great Migration as the moment in which African Americans first become significant in American cities. Not so. Workers on Arrival shows how black people were enslaved in cities and on plantations simultaneously from the beginning of America. Enslaved and free people helped to build and maintain both cities and plantations and farms. And they not only worked in the sort of typecast jobs as general laborers and household servants from the beginning, they also worked as skilled craftsmen and women. Enslaved and free people of color worked in a broad range of skilled crafts. They worked as carpenters, brick masons, blacksmiths, tailors, and seamstresses, just to name a few. Some scholars describe the period between the American Revolution and the early 19th century as a golden age of the black artisans. Slaveholders encouraged African people to learn crafts. Newspapers, the leading newspapers in the country, Boston, Philadelphia, and elsewhere, they regularly advertised for the purchase of enslaved craftsmen and skilled needlewomen. Black artisans brought a wide range of skills and know-how. Early on, they took pride in their specialized knowledge, expertise, and tools. Some European observers described black artisans during the enslavement period as, quote, first rate and excellent. Enslaved and free people of color played a major role in building all of the major cities in America during the colonial and early uh, Republican period in U.S. history. They built cities within the context of British America, uh, French America, Dutch America, and Spanish America. Black people were part of a transnational and global network of European conquest in North America. And they helped to build, their labor helped to build New York City, Philadelphia, and Boston. They also helped to build, of course, Charleston, New Orleans, and Savannah. And so this notion of African American people as enslaved people working in rich the country is a northern and southern story. It's a national story. <coughs> But their contribution to the development of America was not limited to the period before the Civil War. Their contribution to the development of America was part of the industrial period following the Civil War, all the way into the 20th century. Black labor helped to fuel the rise of what I call the United States as predominantly urban industrial nation during the late 19th and early 20th century. In 1865, at the end of the Civil War, the emancipation of some four million people of African descent set in motion the massive great migration of black people from farm to city in America. By the late 20th century, the Great Migration had transformed African Americans into the most urbanized sector of the nation's population. 
And it's an amazing thing because they started off being the most rural, with some people living in cities from the beginning, as the most rural of Americans, and now the most urban of Americans. By the end of World War II, nearly 75% of all African Americans worked in the nation's railroad, <coughs> shipbuilding, meatpacking, steel, rubber, and automobile industries. They were what I call an urban industrial proletariat or working class. In other words, one of the takeaways from this book, what I want people to take away, is a better understanding of how African American labor played a critical role in the development of both pre-industrial America before the Civil War and industrial America during the, the late 19th and 20th centuries. Okay. Well, that's one of the big takeaways, black contribution to the economy. African Americans' enhancement of the wealth and well-being of the nation. But that is not all. This book also tries to underscore how African Americans contributed their labor to the wealth of the nation under pressure, under duress, against the odds. Okay. And what I mean here is that during the early 19th century, that so-called golden age of the black artisan nearly disappeared. Between the end of the Revolutionary War and the beginning of the Civil War, nearly four million European immigrants came to this country. They were predominantly people from Ireland, and Germany. And when they settled in these cities where black people had already taken up residence, they put tremendous pressure on the jobs in the artisan field. And so across the early republic, by the 1820s and 30s, German and Irish immigrants pushed the black artisan more and more to the wall. By the onset of the Civil War, the black artisan had dwindled down to a fraction of his former self. And so that so-called golden age of the black artisan, that even though they were enslaved, slave owners were providing them with training and apprentices with free white workers. But some of these enslaved artisans had brought skills from Africa, and they were able to parlay those skills into the building of America as well. So the way black artisans gained the foothold in that early period was a combination of their African background and their training in America. But as free people of color lost the artisan job, by the 1830s and 40s, and certainly by the 1850s. This was a moment in African American history across cities north and south. Black people were worried that they were becoming a race of servants. They increasingly took jobs at the very bottom of the ladder. They couldn't hold on to their artisan jobs, and they were pushed down in the social structure. And here is some of the, here's what some of them said. A black woman by the name of Maria Stewart, she complained, quote, how long shall the fair daughters of Africa be compelled to bury their talents and their minds beneath a load of heavy iron pots and kettles? In Martin Delaney, a migrant from Virginia to Pittsburgh, he also complained. 
quote, our fathers, other coach men, our brothers, other cook men, and ourselves, other waiting men, end of quote. And so this idea that black people would become in a race of servant worried them and caused a lot of outpouring of sentiment. Martin Delaney made it clear, he said, the occupation of servant is not necessarily degrading, but a whole race of servants are degradation to that people. And so you see black people were wrestling with this idea that work is honorable at whatever level you deal with it. But if, if you only work in the lower rungs of the ladder because of the color line and lack of opportunity to move up, that's a problem. And African American people have to find a way to deal with that problem. And so, what did they do? What did they do? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But before, before they moved to organize, there's another piece of the story. They were not only pushed out of the most lucrative occupation, they also faced tremendous day-to-day -day hostility and intimidation. In 1916, for example, an organization called the American Colonization Society emerged. And the sole purpose of that organization was to transport free people of color from U.S. soil back to Africa and to transform and solidify the United States as a slave-holding republic. And it wanted to rid these free people of color. But at the same time, grassroots attacks on African-American communities escalated. In Cincinnati, Philadelphia, and Providence, Rhode Island, Mobs converged on black communities, destroying churches, businesses, and homes, and driving many black people out of the city. In some cases, early 19th century mobs, they plundered the property and sold the household goods of African Americans, and then they torched the place. <clears throat> Such violence was not limited to the 19th century, I want to say. If we fast forward to the 20th century, the white supremacist Ku Klux Klan, formed right after the Civil War as a rural phenomenon, the Klan reinvented itself as an urban movement. And so during the Great Migration, the Klan followed black people into the industrial cities of the urban north, south, and west. In August 1921, for example, an estimated 10,000 Klansmen attended initiation ceremonies on Chicago's north side. The Imperial Wizard traveled from Atlanta, the Klan's headquarters, to reside over that event. In Detroit, the D Detroit Klan was founded in 1921. It enrolled 22,000 members over the next two years. In May 1921, the Klan established several chapters inside of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And the Klan in Philadelphia took names like the Liberty Bell Clan, number one. The Old Glory Clan, number five. And the William Penn Clan. Closer to home, in 1925, 
The Klan staged its famous national parade at the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. And when I say it closer to home, the Pittsburgh Klan sent the largest single delegation to that event. In the meantime, violence broke out in East St. Louis, Tulsa, Chicago, and other major cities. And in these 20th century riots, police openly supported mob attacks on the black community. In the Chicago riot of 1919, uh, some 1,000 black people lost their home and reported homeless. In other words, what I'm trying to convey, okay, the second takeaway from this book is that African Americans contributed to the wealth of the nation and the power of the nation against the backdrop of racial violence and bloodshed. That's the second great takeaway. First great takeaway, they contributed materially to the wealth of the nation, the power of the nation. Second takeaway, they did this against the arm, under duress, under pressure, under violence and intimidation. That's a tremendous legacy history. I needed a breather anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you probably need a breather anyway. <laughs> okay. But, um, and so those are the two, two big takeaways. But there's a third takeaway. I hope that when you read the book, you'll take a third item away from the book. And that is, even as black people help to build predominantly white cities, they also, at the same time, built their own black metropolis. And so what we begin to see is that African Americans before the Civil War, they launched their own independent institution building activities. What I call they launched the movement to build the black city within the context of the white city. They developed an energetic church building movement across the country. Black people rolled up their sleeves and built churches. They also established fraternal organizations like the Masons, the Elks, the Knights of Pythia, the Oddfellows, all kinds of mutual aid, mutual benefit societies. And they also got to work and build their own businesses that serve a predominantly white clientele in many cases, but also increasingly they built businesses to serve their own people in the context of an environment where black people found the doors closed as they tried to secure different uh, services. Okay, but what I want to underscore, and what the book tries to underscore, something that gets lost in a lot of African American history. African American history, had a, had a class, had a class issue. It had a class issue. So much of African American history was written from the vantage point of the most educated and wealthy black people who managed to make it in some kind of way. But what this book tries to show is that we've got to pay more attention to ordinary, working class black people, both skilled and less skilled, and it is important to do it, especially 
for the 18th century, when blacks built their first <coughs> institutions. The first institutions, in a way, emerged from the labor of ordinary people. And I want to give a couple of examples, and then I'll move, I'll move on. In 1787, in Boston, hairdressers, cooks, and boot blacks established the Prince Hall Masonic Order among African Americans. In 1794, black Philadelphians met in a blacksmith shop to lay the foundation for the rise of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME, the famous Mother Belfer, Mother Belfer. In 1796, in New York City, carpenters, shoemakers, janitors, and other workers formed the African <coughs> Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, A-M-E-Z. In Charleston, South Carolina, Morris Brown, a shoemaker, Spearhead, the formation of the city, AME Church. In Savannah, the Black Baptist Church movement emerged under the leadership of Andrew Bryan, an enslaved black man on a nearby plantation. And so we need to recover these, the energy of these working people and the way they not only built America's largest city, but they started to craft their own. And they had an impact on the urban landscape. Almost all of these institutions moved to build, the first to buy land, and then build their own uh, edifice, their own church building, their own uh, lodge homes. And so these, however modest they may have seen, these building efforts help to shape what America looked like, what urban America looked like. They had an impact on the city skip of America. Another item, and I'll underscore this. I want to make sure I give you some time to ask a few questions. These black people were determined that this labor was going to benefit black people. I'll give you one example. The African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church gained articles of incorporation for its body in 1801. And inside of those New York State certified articles of incorporation, this is what black people insisted on. And they said, and I quote, um, that only Africans or their descendants qualified for membership and election to the Board of Trustees. The congregation also decreed in the Articles of Incorporation that, quote, church property belonged to our African brethren and the descendants of the African race, end of quote. They were determined that the fruits of their labor would accrue to black people now and in perpetuity. Strong nationalist position in the early 19th century. And so moving forward, one of the things this book underscores is that black people have always had a kind of flexibility about where and how they're going to survive as a people. And so they tried to gain independence as a people on the one hand, and at the same time they were pushing to break down barriers to the larger society on the other. Okay, I'm going to sort of wrap up, but I want to say a word, I want to say a word about the African entrepreneurial spirit and the push to build businesses alongside churches, fraternal orders, social clubs, and so on. 
African American businesses, one of them was the barber business that emerged during the early 19th century as a major occupation for black people. And one reason the barber business emerged so prominent among blacks is that after the American Revolutionary War, white barbers said, we are not going to do this anymore. You know, this is a servile occupation, and now we are free members of a democratic republic, and we're going to leave this servility behind. And so they opened the door for the black barber to gain a footing in the barber trade, and their numbers increased. And because many of them served white clients, they became pretty wealthy, some of them, including in the city of Pittsburgh, not far from here. But it created a dilemma, too. And that dilemma is that white customers insisted that these barbers only cut the hair of white people. And so in northern cities particularly, and in parts of the south as well, African Americans started to gain freedom. And so you know by the 1830s or 40s, most black people in northern cities, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, they were free people. And they were beginning to protest against the color line, against free people of color in institutions across the urban north. And they said, wait, uh, there's something wrong with this picture. The black barber won't cut our hair either. And so to share with the audience uh, an illustration of how this looked and how it sounded, please bear with me. Now I'm going to close it down so we have at least 10 minutes for it. This is in New York City. Uh, in 1838, a black newspaper carried this story about a black man um, who experienced something in Orange County, New York, when he entered a black barber shop in Newburgh. This is what he said. I'm going to read this to you. I went out to get my hair cut and my beard shaved off. And for the purpose, I called at the shop of a colored barber. And sir, he would not touch my face with the handle of his razor, nor my head with the back of his shears. When I entered the shop, he had finished shaving a white man. I asked him, as politely as I could, if I could get my beard shaved off, he turned his eye with a slavish and fearful look toward the white man in the shop. And he groaned out loudly, no sir, we don't shave colored people here in the fault. <laughs> okay, this man was living, no, no, he was angry. Here he is trying to break down the barriers among you know, white people, and now he's got to fight black people. And so the civil rights movement has to move inside the community and desegregate black institutions, just like it desegregated white institutions. But then this barber, and not this barber, but this man, he went to a famous know, abolitionist black newspaper, The Call of America. He thought he was going to get great sympathy that the editor of the paper was going to say, injustice, injustice, you got to do something about this. The editor said, wait a minute, <laughs> not so fast. Uh, these black barbers are making pretty good money serving only white people. But they are also contributing greatly to the building of the black church and to the large hall in our city. They are playing an important role in the city building process among black people. And so we should give them a little leeway so that they are not under pressure from blacks to end their business with white customers. And, and I'm going to say this and then I'll just conclude very quickly with a few comments. But believe it or not, during the Civil Rights Movement in Davidson, uh, North Carolina, 
There was a holdover. There was a black barber in the city during the time of Martin Luther King's marches and eventually his death. A holdout. He refused to serve black people in his shop. And it took black and white students at the nearby college organizing a picket line around his establishment before he desegregated. <laughs> okay, so, so let me just summarize. What am I trying to ask you to take away uh, from this book? Number one, black people were contributors, producers, not just consumers. Okay, number two, they carried out these tremendous services for the country under a lot of pressure. And number three, at the same time that they were doing this, they found time to build their own city, their own black metropolis. Thank you. So uh, Sean told me that we should open it up for a few questions before we convey, I mean, we are adjourned. And so I'm going to do that. You, and it doesn't have to be a question, it could be a comment, anything. Yeah. Okay, Scott. My first question is uh, when you talk about the black organizations that, that started to grow as a result <clears throat> of the various obstacles that they were facing, when did, uh, or did that incorporate, when you talk about the uh, Prince Hall, Free and Seven Masons, the AME, the AMEZ, how far, how soon after that did historical black colleges and universities okay. come onto the map? Yeah, uh, I, I think after the Civil War, it's been really the heyday when historical black colleges uh, okay. gained their footing and gained some support, you know, among, you know, um, the white allies, Republican allies and so on. So yeah, that's a story about the post uh, Civil War period for the most part. But the building of schools, stuff. the building, and, and see, I could have put in the, the African-American institution building process included churches, fraternal orders, social clubs, uh, businesses, and schools. Schools was a great motivator, and then so they did that. But at the college level, and by the way, the college, colleges, the first colleges were literally elementary and maybe high school. They were not real full-fledged colleges until <coughs> over time they became certified as colleges. But they were the foundation of historically black colleges. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, John, I have a question. Um, you have put in your book a picture of a painting. And people who know, who know me know I like sharks. There's a shark attack in the painting, but it has significance. Would you talk about what's significant about it? The Copley painting. Okay. Now, what you mean the, the, the show? Yeah, the painting with the man in it and the shark. Oh yeah, that yeah. Well that actually had to do with black people in a way I think what I was trying to demonstrate there is that black people were very much involved in maritime, you know, commerce. And also um, they were great talents. Uh, during the period. And one of the stories that we haven't talked a lot about is that these large seagoing vessels that Europeans were able to man, uh, they couldn't do very much unless they got the help of these black, uh, most often enslaved pilots who would steer these ships locally uh, through these very treacherous, you know, terrain. Uh, in order to get into the cities and carry out commerce and so on. And so I think that one reflects on that. Yes. We are in a service economy. Um, and I believe it started about 1975, around that very we had the gasoline crisis. And, um, and we had the movement of industries out of the United States. Okay, you're saying that there still is a discrepancy between the working class Caucasian and the working class 
um, African Americans. How how do you, do you address this in your book? Um, I, I moved to the edge of that issue uh, because you know these are issues that are still unfolding. And my basic premise is that because there has been such great destruction with the movement of manufacturing out of the country or just simply collapsing, and because that created a substantial body of people who were uh, unemployed or working at very low wage labor, that as a result of that, there is a sense that the American working class is perhaps not as productive as it had been in the past. But I make the point that we've got to start re-envisioning what it means to be working class, and that these workers who are orderlies and nurses' aides and fast food workers, they are contributing materially to the well-being and health of the economy. And somebody's gain benefits, you know, from the low wage and uh, very minimal benefits kind of work. And I think we should start to pay attention to how this new economy is creating a different kind of working class, but a working class that nevertheless is adding something of value. That's the way I'm thinking about it. But it's a new era, what I call the digital age, and many of you call it digital age, both industrial, but that there is this system emerging. One of the things for African Americans, though, is that we know the old workforce dissipated, and there was a reorientation into not just the bottom rungs of the service ladder, but into the more uh, skilled and educated uh, levels. And that African Americans, we know from some of the evidence, were not equally reoriented at the upper uh, ends of the service economy. They were reoriented into the lower ends. Well, so, yeah. so your point is well taken, and I wish that I had more to say about that, but this is what sociologists, economists, political scientists, they're working hard on that. Um, may I have a follow-up question? Um, when you talk about the system that is skilled, workers, we also have some professional skilled workers in the nursing, the um, education, and so how are they doing, how are African Americans doing? I know that I have worked with African American teachers, um, even though West Virginia's population is you know, small. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's a good point. And, um, of course, uh, nurses trained, you know, certified professional nurses. Um, we're often now seen as not being remunerated properly, you know, for the work that they do. But when looking at the African American component, I'm just talking about the way in which uh, blacks are disproportionately orderly in the hospital services sector. And so there's inequality within the lower ranks of inequality among people who may be suffering at another level. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I agree. More needs to be done for trained social workers, trained teachers, trained nurses uh, to help them uh, solidify themselves. But then at the other end of the ladder, we just have so much more work to do. And education is one part of it, trying to open that door and create opportunities. And then the Prison system is another part for African Americans, so we can't ignore, you know, that there is a complicated intertwining of all these issues. Well, thank you for that question. Yes. I just like to add that in 1976, I worked for William Pittsburgh School at 37 years. Uh, they passed a consent decree, and I became a machinist, and that's the only way that I spent my time. Uh, 35 years of being a machinist. But if it hadn't been for that consent decree, I would have known the game. Okay, yeah. Thank you.
is served. 